three people who have never met before are about to find out how they're linked to one of the bloodiest naval conflicts of all time, the Battle of Trafalgar. They'll have their eyes opened to the shocking realities of war at sea. The sooner you get rid of that limb, the greater the chance of survival. They'll discover the frontline brutality endured by their ancestors. This is just one ship trying to survive in the middle of a titanic naval battle. And uncover how closely the fates of their relatives were entwined. So thanks to you, I'm standing here today. Oh, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> Three ordinary people are about to find out how they're linked to one extraordinary event in British history through their ancestors. Jennifer Marriott is an actress and writer from Hampshire. Alan Abraham is a retired army officer who lives in Wiltshire. And Bridget Tomsett is a farmer from Wales. They've never met before, but they're about to undertake a journey that will reveal how they're linked to the historic Battle of Trafalgar. In 1805, Emperor Napoleon controlled much of continental Europe and amassed a combined Spanish and French fleet which sought to challenge both Britain's trade and empire. In response, the Admiralty assembled a special fleet to annihilate this threat and placed it under the control of one of its most popular and successful leaders, Vice Admiral Horatio Lord Nelson. On the 21st of October 1805, a major sea battle would take place off the southwest coast of Spain. The outcome of which would determine who would control the seas for the next 100 years. This is the compelling story of the Battle of Trafalgar. Alan is on his way to meet genealogist Sarah Hill. He's completely unaware that he has a significant connection to the Battle of Trafalgar. The news that there might be someone famous in the family is the most interesting and I'm, uh, I'm fascinated to know who, who it might be. Using the Find My Past website, Sarah is searching the 1891 census. We're going to follow the line through one person on this page. Right. And this person is Mary McGregor. She's your great, great, great grandmother. For now, we're going to look for Mary McGregor mm -hmm. in the marriage records. Right. So this is a newspaper notice about the marriage. Married on the fourth instant, St James's Church, uh, John Athol McGregor Esquire, to Mary Charlotte Hardy, youngest daughter of Rear Admiral Sir Thomas Hardy. Can you think of any naval yeah. Hardys? No, yeah. uh, I can think of a Nelsonian Hardy. Yes. Yeah. Sir Thomas Hardy, who was with Nelson right. at the Battle of Trafalgar, is right. your great, 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 great grandfather. Good Lord. I don't know what, what I'm meant to say. How extraordinary. <laughs> that is absolutely remarkable. Well, no one's mentioned that before. <laughs> By the early 19th century, the Royal Navy dominated the seas. Mastery of the oceans was vital to Britain as an island with a burgeoning overseas empire. Despite enjoying military supremacy in mainland Europe, Napoleon realised that to win the war, he needed to take down the British Navy and leave Britain and her colonies vulnerable. In 1804, when Spain allied with France, Napoleon finally thought he had a fleet large enough to challenge the British Navy. The scene was set for an encounter that was to determine control of the seas and ultimately crown a world power. Alan is at the Royal Naval Museum in Portsmouth to meet maritime historian Andrew Lambert to learn more about his ancestor Thomas Hardy and his role in this battle for naval supremacy. He's a man who starts his naval career, fairly humble circumstances, he comes from Dorset. There's certainly a family tradition down on the south coast of getting into the Navy, but he doesn't really have the access and he spends some of his time serving on merchant ships. So he learns his trade the hard way. He becomes an outstanding sea officer. 
and he learns that from the bottom up. Hardy and Nelson first met on board a frigate and on that cruise Hardy is now a lieutenant and as they sailed through the Straits of Gibraltar a man fell overboard from the frigate and Hardy immediately launched a boat to pick up the man. Uh, at this point the Spanish fleet appeared and came bearing down on Nelson's frigate and Nelson had two options he could sail on and leave Hardy to be taken or he could stop and pick the man up mm -hmm. uh, and he took the second he said I won't lose Hardy he'd already formed a very high opinion of this young officer so just as Nelson is on the cusp of greatness he's already beginning to pick his following of bright young officers mm -hmm. and Hardy is right in the team from the start mm -hmm. On her way to find out about another member of Nelson's team is Welsh farmer Bridget. She has absolutely no idea that any of her ancestors were at Trafalgar. Genealogist Megan Owens is looking up Bridget's father's side of the family in the 1891 census. But what we're going to do now is go to Margaret. My great-grandmother. Yes. And we're going to actually go 50 years earlier to 1841 and we're going to search the name Rivers. I've never heard that name. This gentleman, William Rivers, right. is Margaret's grandfather Hello. and his parents names are William Rivers and Anne Rivers and we are looking up William Rivers senior so this is your four times great-grandfather. He appears in 1817. It's actually his obituary. Death of Lord Nelson's gunner. He was in most of the general actions of the late wars. The last, though not the least, of his active service was with the gallant Nelson in the ever memorable Battle of Trafalgar. Well, there we are. <laughs> so, so what do you make of William Rivers on the victory? Well, I didn't know the name William Rivers and I didn't know that he was the gunner there. So this is all quite new to me. Rivers was the master gunner on HMS Victory, Nelson's imposing flagship at the Battle of Trafalgar. Victory may have had the Admiral on board, but the running of the ship fell to her captain. Nelson picked the man he knew wouldn't let him down, Thomas Hardy, Allen's four times great-grandfather. Uh, Thomas Hardy was one of the great captains. He understood how to keep a ship's company in discipline. So he flogged a lot of men. Uh, but he was very consistent and what naval men liked least of all was inconsistency. They liked a captain who if you did a bad thing you got flogged for it today, tomorrow and every day. Mm -hmm. And finally there's something which uh, you bring with you today. Hardy is a very tall man. Really? Interesting. <laughs> uh, he's so tall that as he walks around the ship he's bent double. Uh, but he's also profoundly bald so the first thing the crew see as Hardy walks about the ship is the top of his shiny head so they refer to him as the ghost so Nelson uses Hardy not only to keep the ship running but also as his eyes Nelson's eyes were damaged one eye was blind the other eye was was imperfect Nelson relied on Hardy to tell him what was out there Hardy gives Nelson all the things that he doesn't have himself commanding physical presence the ability to manage the ship and not have to worry about the Admiral's job they obviously had a a close working relationship, is that right? Yes, it is. Really, this relationship with Nelson is the defining moment of his life. Nelson could have had any captain in the Navy, but he stuck with Hardy. Coming up, Jennifer finds out about her ancestors' role in history's most famous sea battle. And Bridget experiences the job of the Royal Navy's gunner, first hand. Alan Abraham and Bridget Thompson have discovered that they're related to two key figures from one of the greatest naval conflicts of all time, the Battle of Trafalgar. Writer and actress Jennifer Marriott is aware she's connected to the infamous encounter, but doesn't know all the details. Using the Find My Past website, genealogist Sarah Hill is helping Jennifer trace the link. 
Here is your grandmother, Ethel G. Henderson. Oh, yes. She's 20 at the time. And here we have her yes. mother, Mary Henderson. Yes. And her father, Frederick Henderson. Okay. Who was right. a retired Lieutenant Colonel. What we are going to do is go onto um, a newspaper archive, and that comes up with this article, which is very interesting. Lieutenant Colonel Henderson writes as follows. My mother, nay Eliza Beatty, was the only niece of Dr. William Beatty, surgeon to the victory. William Beatty didn't have any children, so right. the only descendants um, of William Beatty are through Eliza. So William Beatty is your great, 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 great uncle. How fascinating. Mm. William Beatty was to join Captain Hardy and Gunner Rivers as the surgeon looking after the 800 strong crew aboard HMS Victory as she set sail for Trafalgar. The descendant of Gunner William Rivers, Bridget, has come to meet maritime author Peter Goodwin at Fort Nelson in Portsmouth, home to the Royal Armouries National Collection of Artillery, also known as the Big Guns. Well, Bridget, we've got something very fantastic here to show you. This is a 12-pounder gun. There are 104 guns on the Victory. Um, ranging between 12 and 32 pounders and these guns would have been under the total supervision of William Rivers. The ship is basically a fighting floating gun platform and a ship like the Victory, her total capability as a weapon was greater than all the guns that Wellington had at Waterloo. The master gunner was directly responsible to the commanding officer of the ship, which on the victory would have been Captain Hardy, on all aspects of gunnery, ammunition, all the muskets, the control and safety of the magazines, the storage of the powder. Do we know anything about William Rivers as a person? Oh, yes, we do. Um, because he left all his journals and we found out all sorts of things about this man. He collects recipes for cheese and butter. He tells you how to make ink. He has recipes for herbal medicines. What we can see is a very curious man, a very observant man, and in all, a very clever man. Jennifer is at the Royal Naval Museum in Portsmouth to meet Mick Crumplin, an expert in surgical history, to learn more about her ancestor, William Beatty. He trained as a young man and entered an apprenticeship at about 50 to right. a, a naval surgeon for about two years. And by the age of 18, he actually qualified by diploma. Good. And it was at that time that he entered naval service. Was that particularly young? Or? Yes, it was. It was about Sounds. two or three years younger than it should Good have been. Good heavens, how amazing. And this is some mark of his ability. Being a surgeon implies he did nothing but surgery, but he had other responsibilities on a ship. He had to see that clothing and diet and the conditions were healthy for those men. And if the crew had a good surgeon, then you would be confident about going into battle and knowing that you'd get good care. Because this is frontline surgery. It's surgery on the spot. As soon as you're hit, you're operated on. So the, so the men had confidence in... BT yeah. and therefore confidence they in They knew that they had a, a one in five chance of being injured and if that was the case they wanted decent medical care. It's like you going into hospital and being utterly confident that when you go to sleep the right thing's going to be done. <laughs> but unlike today, 19th century surgeons were doing their operations without anaesthetic. And what would they have used this for? This is a, what's called a tenon saw and right. it's used for dividing the bone on a limb that you wish to remove because if your limb has been smashed by a cannonball the infecting bacteria will cause a septicemia so the sooner you get rid of that limb the greater the chance of survival it's very unpleasant for the patient to listen to the bone being cut and it hurts because the covering of the bone was sensitive mm -hmm. and BC would have disliked operating mm. because he was hurting the patient yes. but he knew yes. he'd have to get on with it yes. he was just a darn good in your face, doctors. Doctor. Yes. And I think he guarded that reputation jealously. By October 1805, much of Napoleon's combined fleet were anchored in Cadiz, overseen by French Admiral Pierre de Villeneuve. This naval threat was too close to Britain for comfort, and the Admiralty knew they had to take action. 
Napoleon ordered Admiral Pierre de Villeneuve to set sail with a largely untested fleet comprising of 41 French and Spanish ships. They would sail southeast from Cadiz and enter the Mediterranean through the Straits of Gibraltar, just off the Cape of Trafalgar. However, waiting for them on board the flagship HMS Victory and commanding a further 32 ships was Nelson. All about global communications. Mm -hmm. If the British can trade with the world, they will survive Napoleon. If they lose the trade of the world, mm -hmm. they're defeated. So if the enemy have a great fleet and they put it to sea, it has to be destroyed. So when the French finally come out of Cadiz uh, in the middle of October 1805, the question for Nelson is not can we fight the enemy, but how quickly can we destroy them so that they can never do this again, mm -hmm. so that British command of the sea is absolute. How is a naval battle conducted? Naval battles in the age of Nelson are really rather grim attritional fights in which very large numbers of heavy guns are fired from wooden ships into other wooden ships. And ships like Victory were monsters of the sea. They were 230 feet long with two foot thick hulls. They were constructed from 6,000 oak trees. They were almost impossible to sink. The only way that you win these battles is by forcing the enemy to stop fighting back. And that's usually a matter of killing and wounding the crew. You simply grind them down steadily, effectively reducing their capacity to fight until eventually they decide they, they can't function anymore. Battles of this type, ship to ship, an hour and a half is a pretty average amount of time. You, you simply can't force them to stop any sooner than that. You have to batter them into submission. If you allow them to sail away, they won't fight. Right. So Nelson is constantly thinking, how do I bring this to a conclusion? Mm -hmm. Because in the main, the biggest problem the British had in these wars is finding the French fleet, and when they found it, forcing it to fight, and when they forced it to fight, making it stop in the fight until the fight was over. One advantage the British Navy had was because we blockaded the enemy ports and stopped their ships getting to sea, it meant that our men were continually operating at sea. They were more practiced. While you kept your enemy in the harbour, he couldn't get on with doing his trading. So how fast and how often could these guns be fired? You could fire and reload this gun in approximately one and a half minutes. And it's this speed of gunnery and the capability and the training given by people like your ancestor for these guns crews is the key issue why we had naval supremacy over our enemies at that period. When warships like HMS Victory fired all the guns set along the length of the hull into the enemy, this crippling fire was known as a broadside. When Victory would fire a broadside, something like about um, one and a half tons of iron was disappearing off in towards the direction of the enemy. And if Every you minute or yes, so. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> So if William Rivers' gang could, um, could fire every one and a half or even one minute, how much better was this than, than the enemy's? Our firing rate was Fire possibly power. about three times the speed of the enemy. There also was the fact that we had better discipline in all aspects within our ships. Even Napoleon himself, when he was being taken into captivity on a British warship, remarked on the fact that on British ships, when an order was given, everything was done in absolute silence and methodology, which is not what happens in the French or even the Spanish ships. Now we're going to have the opportunity to actually fire this gun using gunpowder, but we will not be firing a round shot because that will be illegal today. Load with cartridge. We're about to put in a four pound charge of gunpowder. That, when ignited, will increase 300 times its volume, which forces the shot out towards the enemy. Slow match. Make ready. Fire the gun. French Admiral Villeneuve's ships may have been less prepared for battle than those led by disciplinarian Hardy or trained by Gunner Rivers, but they still outnumbered the British in men and guns. 
However, the Admiralty knew from previous experience that Nelson would find a way to catch the enemy off guard. Nelson never uses the same battle plan twice. Mm -hmm. He always thinks about the grand strategic context in which he's fighting before he thinks about how you fight the battle itself. As he's refining the plan to achieve the ultimate strategic objective, the annihilation of the enemy. Mm -hmm. Standard battle tactics dictated admirals should form their fleet into lines and fire broadsides into the enemy. And they would then exchange fire for as long as possible mm. until one side decided they'd had enough and they would almost certainly then leave. Nelson decided to go for something completely unprecedented mm -hmm. to attack the enemy bow on in two columns, perpendicular attack straight mm -hmm. into the heart of the enemy's fleet. What he wants to do is break the enemy's formation, pin them in battle, and then setting up one-on-one -on -one battles between British, mm -hmm. French, and Spanish ships. Mm -hmm. It's a huge risk because all the while they're approaching, they will be within easy range of the enemy fleet, which will mm -hmm. be firing on them from full broadsides. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the flagships will take a lot of punishment before they get to battle. Nelson does it because he knows that his people are better than the enemy, that his ships are better than the enemy's ships. Nelson's plan was in place. Victory would lead the fleet into an encounter that would see almost 50,000 men firing over 4,000 guns at each other in one of the bloodiest battles in naval history. It was down to the men on board to keep the ships operational under intense fire. For Rivers, Beatty and Hardy, how they performed in the next 24 hours would be crucial. Hardy now has to get the ship up to speed for a battle mm. so that the ship is ready to be the most powerful fighting instrument on the planet. Mm -hmm. And to be the captain of the flagship in a Nelson battle means mm. that you can see some serious action. Coming up, Alan, Bridget and Jennifer climb aboard HMS Victory to experience the battle through the eyes of their ancestors. And Bridget discovers she had not one but two relatives risking their lives on the ship. Alan, Bridget and Jennifer have discovered the level of skill and discipline their ancestors required to make the Royal Navy the ruler of the waves. Now they'll each board HMS Victory in Portsmouth to see for themselves where the Battle of Trafalgar played out for their relatives. With Jennifer, the four-time great-niece of Surgeon William Beatty, is historian Professor Lawrence Brockless. Well, Jennifer, now we're on the all-op deck which was normally the berth of the midshipmen, but time of battle, the midshipmen's things were cleared out of the way and it became the surgery. It was below the waterline, so it was relatively safe, given oh. it was a wooden ship. Oh, I see. Had you been involved in any battle like this before? No, this was his first and only major battle. In that respect, he was really no different from most surgeons in the Royal Navy at the time, so it must be very daunting. Mm. And we know that some of the surgeons panicked Did they when they were confronted by casualties coming down in large numbers. So it was really the, the test of manhood. It's amazing. Helping Bridget to explore the Victory's gunnery, home to the 104 guns that her ancestor William Rivers maintained for 18 years, is naval author Tim Clayton. So Bridget, here we are on the lower gun deck, um, the lowest of the three gun decks on, on HMS Victory and this is where your ancestor William Rivers would have spent much of his battle. It actually starts very, very slowly. When they see the French fleet it's 11 miles away and the wind is very, very light. So there's a long, long period when they're slowly moving towards the enemy. They actually sit down and have breakfast. They have a, a bit of raw pork and half a pint of wine, is what one seaman records. On the quarter deck, the nerve center of HMS Victory, Alan is walking in his ancestor, Captain Thomas Hardy's footsteps with naval historian Andrew Lambert. So Alan, this is the command position where Hardy, Nelson and all of the command team would have been stationed during the battle and Hardy would have been right at Nelson's uh, right hand all the way through the battle. So this is where it all happened, right here? Right here. How exciting, yeah, fantastic. 
At 6 a.m. on the 21st of October, the British fleet formed two columns, one of which was led by Nelson here on HMS Victory. The Royal Navy benefited not only from Nelson's daring and unique battle plan, but also by his complete belief in his captains to use their initiative in the heat of battle, unlike the Spanish and French counterparts who were not allowed to use their own judgment. The British began to close in on the enemy, but then the wind dropped. HMS Victory was subjected to ferocious broadsides and unable to fight back. Nelson's fleet was outnumbered and outgunned. Undaunted, Nelson sent out his famous signal. England expects that every man will do his duty. Critical to Nelson's plan was the point at which he would breach the Franco-Spanish line. Nelson needed to isolate the enemy's flagships, including Villeneuve's ship, the Busson Tour, to prevent them signalling to the rest of the fleet. It was Hardy's first test. The command team is up here, they're looking for the enemy flagship, but the man who's going to find it for Nelson is Hardy. He's the man with the seamanship, good pair of eyes and a commanding physique, so he's looking out for all the telltale signs. And then Villeneuve breaks his flag, and it's clear what, what the target is. And as the two columns are approaching the enemy fleets, they come just under a mile range, the enemy are firing constantly, and everybody on the upper deck is now exposed, and they're just having to take it. It's coming in over the bow, and it's knocking people down on the ship. The ship's wheel is hit by a round shot and smashed. So now Hardy has a problem. He can't even steer the ship directly. He's having to relay orders down to the relief tiller. Absolute panic stations there as people rush down here to rig ropes to the tiller, which is at the end of this deck, and 20 seamen there to haul it round in a speaking tube to the top to say, take it so much to port, into the line. So he's having to steer the ship at third hand to thread through the eye of a needle to punch under the enemy ship's stern. And he says to Nelson, I'm not sure we can get through. And Nelson says, let's just go for it. Finally, Victory finds herself in a position to pass the French flagship. And it's on the Busson tour that at this moment, Victory concentrates its fire. Um, and they fire a raking broadside, the most damaging thing you can do in a naval battle through the stern of the ship in a sort of rippling fire as the ship passes the Busson Tour. The stern is mostly glass and thin wood and that just smashes. You're firing all the way down the line of guns. All the sailors are in your line of fire. It's so noisy that any instructions are given out in sign language. Most amazing smoke and heat. They're getting gradually blacker with powder. Load, reload, fire recoil, get it, ram it back out. Your ancestor is very much in his element here, yes. The joy of big guns firing is his sort of thing. The enemy's flagship is now disabled. It's powerless, it's unable to signal, move, and the admiral, who's unwounded, is trapped on his flagship. He can't do anything. He's now a spectator yeah. in his own battle. Nelson had succeeded in cutting off the enemy's communication and, unused to using their own judgment, their captains were in chaos. However, victory had taken a heavy pounding and as the wounded poured down from the top deck in their dozens, Beatty was waiting for them. You're below the water line. The only light you've got is candlelight. Mm -hmm. The ship's also moving the whole mm -hmm. time because the, the big guns mm -hmm. are overhead. Very, very noisy as well. Mm -hmm. Speed is clearly of the essence. Some of these people are going to be in a very bad way indeed. It's very, very difficult to imagine how anyone could have worked under such conditions. Beatty was inundated with casualties. Limbs smashed by cannonballs, organs punctured by musket shot, and countless wounds from splinters sent flying when the wooden hull was hit. Anybody who's in the way gets large splinters, perhaps about that size, hitting them at very fast speeds. So it's as if you've been struck by you know, a number of daggers and uh, you'd be bleeding profusely. This is a copy of a list of the wounded that appear in Beatty's log. Just note how long it is. Normally there may have been a couple of names, three or four people in the sick pay, but on this occasion 102 members of the complement were actually brought down here and given treatment of some kind. On the deck above, Victory's gunner was hard at work. 
So what is my ancestor William Rivers actually doing at this point now? He's making sure that everything is working properly. The supply of powder to the guns, all the gun teams are performing properly. If any of the guns are damaged, he and a group of his mates will rush over there and try and repair anything that can be repaired. But what Bridget doesn't know is that she had more than one relative on the ship at the time of the battle. Apart from all his professional worries, William Rivers has something else to worry about because he has his own son on board, 17-year-old William Rivers Jr., who's a midshipman, and his station is up on the quarterdeck where it's really hot, where the bullets are really flying around, and not all that far into the battle as the action hots up. He sees his own son being supported down the rope ladders, badly wounded. His foot was hanging off by a little bit of skin, and he's got to trust that William Beatty is going to do a good job. On the all-op deck, Rivers Jr. was just one of 11 amputations that Beatty had to perform during the battle, at high speed and with no anaesthetic. There's a certain advantage in the Navy because these casualties are being brought straight down oh, from the deck on which yes. they've been wounded. When they were still, I suppose, a state of, of shock, shock, and yes. it was possible to deal with them uh, frequently without them, I suspect, feeling as much as they would otherwise have done so. And it's this wonderful story of the, the young rivers. He had to have his left leg amputated below the knee. He seems to almost treat it as a joke because clearly he's in, in some sort of euphoric mood. Cut my foot off. This is of no use. I say, Doctor, when will you take me in hand? I will sit on the table. You may cut where you please. My men, it is nothing to have a limb off. You'll find pleasure when you come here, men, to get rid of your shattered limb. An hour and a half into the battle, HMS Victory was still under attack. She'd moved away from the decimated French flagship, but collided with another French ship, the Rue du Table and had locked masts. The Red Table's captain, Jean-Luc Alves, decided that he can't fight the English with cannon. He's going to fight them with muskets and try and board. So he has most of his men firing down here onto the, the upper deck of Victory, from up, from up in the rigging, throwing hand grenades and musketry. So now this becomes a very, very empty place with a lot of dead and wounded men lying around. Nelson and Hardy are walking up between the hatchway and where the ship's wheel is, backwards and forwards, because there's no job for an admiral. He can't do anything, so he and Hardy are actually preparing to write the after-action battle report where Nelson is hit. He falls to the deck just there where the famous brass plaque says Nelson fell here, and Hardy knows immediately he can't leave Nelson lying on the deck. Uh, it's very bad for morale, so he has Captain Secker of the Marines and, and two Blue Jackets pick him up and carry him quickly below. When Nelson had been brought down to the all-up, Beatty feels the wound. Nelson himself says that he has no feeling in the lower half of his body, so it's clearly a spinal injury of some kind. But more importantly, Nelson says that he can feel very regular intervals of blood pumping into his body. The pulmonary artery has been severed. In his book, The Authentic Narrative of the Death of Lord Nelson, Beatty recalls his diagnosis. His lordship said, Ah, BT. I too am certain of it. You know I am gone. I replied, My lord, unhappily for our country, nothing can be done for you. Essentially, Nelson was, was put to one side while BT got on with dealing with all the other patients that were being presented to him. Up on the quarter deck, the battle was still raging, and it was Hardy calling the shots still the flagship the flag is still flying so he is still leading the fleet and the fleet is rallying around him so he has to be Nelson and Hardy in a ship that's badly damaged and has suffered heavy casualties and in the middle of all of this his best friend his his leader his commander has been lying down there mortally wounded and Hardy's been desperate to go down and talk to him but he's had to stay up here and get the job done so this is the crisis of the battle this is just one ship trying to survive in the middle of a titanic naval battle Still bound to the Rue du Table, victory was in a perilous position. And the French are hoping to get on board with a large number of men and actually take the flagship. 
So the French are right on the cusp of some, trying something remarkable. Mm -hmm. And just as the Redoubtable's men are getting ready to board, they're all standing up, exposed. The Temerac, Nelson's support ship, right behind him in the line, crashes into them on the other side and fires a broadside which just wipes them out. And the Redoubtable is, is forced to surrender. The ship is battered, it will sink soon. And the crew has been reduced from 650 to 100. Uh, they've just been annihilated. Coming up, Alan, Bridget and Jennifer meet for the first time and discuss the consequences for their ancestors, how this triumphant battle turns to tragedy. Alan, Bridget and Jennifer have relived the Battle of Trafalgar from their ancestors' point of view. A battle which had a profound effect on each of them. After six hours of fierce fighting, the Battle of Trafalgar was finally won by the British fleet. Nelson's unorthodox tactics combined with the skill of his captains along with the efficiency and professionalism of the crews had all worked to devastating effect. The casualties for the French and Spanish totaled 14,000 compared to 1,500 for the British. That victory at Trafalgar meant Britain did rule the ways for the next 100 years. Nelson remains one of our greatest heroes and HMS Victory one of Britain's greatest icons. This rather wonderful little ancient book is William Rivers' own notebook particularly wanted to show you one thing, some remarks that William Rivers Jr. Is, is supposed to have made during the battle as he's wounded, as he's carried down. He called out on the other side of cockpit, here I am father, nothing is the matter with me, only lost my leg and that is in a good cause. He looked for my shoes, one is now as good as a pair. It's amazing, it's obviously a father who's really proud, Very proud. of <laughs> how his son had behaved. Andrew has brought Alan down to the rear of the Orlop deck on HMS Victory. This is where Captain Hardy had Nelson brought after he was mortally wounded. And it's down here that the great tragedy of Nelson has played out. When was Hardy able to come down here? Hardy comes down when he's able to tell Nelson the thing that he needs to know most of all, that the enemy has been decisively beaten. So Nelson now knows that what he set out to achieve has been achieved. And Hardy now moves from being his captain to being his friend. And realizing that his time is, is ebbing away, there's something final and very personal that, that Hardy is going to do for him. And he says, he does say, kiss me, Hardy. Mm -hmm. uh, just some last little touch of human warmth and, and, and affection mm -hmm. for this enormously affectionate man. Mm -hmm. and, and Hardy does bend and kiss him on the forehead. Was, was Captain Hardy there when Nelson died? No, he wasn't. He's always shown as being there because he's, he's one of the two or three figures in the picture that is always clearly identifiable. But he wasn't present. And really, you get a very strong impression that Hardy went back up to the upper deck to look after the ship because he couldn't bear to be here any longer. Mm -hmm. He's seen many men die, but this wasn't any man. This was mm -hmm. the man. Nelson then utters over and over again his dying motto where he says, thank God I've done my duty, mm -hmm. and then he just drifts off. Mm -hmm. Unlike the other 56 crew members killed at Trafalgar, Nelson's body was not thrown overboard, but instead preserved by placing it in a cask of brandy until victory reached land. My ancestor William Beatty, was he a good surgeon? He amputated. 11 limbs in the course of the battle and only three of the patients died oh, yeah. which was a very good strike record indeed in fact of the 102 wounded treated by Beatty there were only six deaths but saving lives was not his only legacy everything we know about Nelson's last hours are totally drawn from the account that your predecessor William Beatty wrote about the battle below decks, a fitting and emotional account of the, the end of this hero. So Beatty was not just a great surgeon, in some ways he was a great writer. 
Trafalgar is a triumph and a tragedy, the thing that, N that Nelson stands for. He is Britain. When he says in that great signal, England expects, what he means is, I expect. Because on the 21st of October, off Cape Trafalgar, Nelson was England for everybody in the fleet. He was the very embodiment of what England meant mm -hmm. and why the English were still fighting. Nelson to this day is commemorated as one of Britain's greatest ever commanders. Captain Hardy continued to have an illustrious career in the Royal Navy and in 1830 he was appointed first sea lord at the Admiralty. William Rivers, the master gunner, retired at around the same time HMS Victory was decommissioned in 1812. He died at the age of 62. William Rivers Jr. was granted a pension after losing a foot at Trafalgar. He later married and brought up seven children. Beatty became a highly respected and influential physician and was accepted as a member of the Royal Society. He retired in 1839, aged 66, and was a member of the organizing committee for building Nelson's Column in Trafalgar Square. Alan, Bridget and Jennifer are intimately connected to the Battle of Trafalgar. Each of them has been given a memento of their journey and their meeting for the first time to find out how their ancestors' stories came together on this fateful day in history. One by one I'm going to ask you to open an envelope because I think you've been given a memento of your journey. And Alan, you're going first. Well, I've got a depiction of uh, Admiral Nelson here. This is Captain Hardy, who is my relative, who was essentially in charge of HMS Victory and to a large extent the rest of the fleet during the battle. And Nelson chose him to be his right-hand man, you might say. Show us what you've got in your envelope. Right. Looks very similar, doesn't it? This gentleman here is my ancestor, which was uh, Sir William Beattie, who was the surgeon on the HMS Victory. So, we have your relative looking after the great Nelson. Yes. With your relative close by. Mm -hmm. My goodness. Mm -hmm. oh. It's incredible, isn't it? It is, actually. Um, I'm now going to look to you, aren't I, Bridget? You are. Here we have a portrait of my ancestor, the one responsible for making all that noise. <laughs> <laughs> he was the chief gunner. This is um, William Rivers. Oh. He was taking his orders directly from your ancestor. <laughs> and um, he was in complete charge of all the guns... So all your relatives are instrumental in the victory at Trafalgar. But there's one more connection, isn't there? Yes, because um, this William Rivers um, had a son, also William Rivers, who your ancestor saved the life of by taking his leg off. So thanks to you, I'm standing here today. Oh, bless you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. We, have you all been on HMS Victory? Yes. And I came away from there quite, uh, quite disturbed by it, really. And mm. the following night, I couldn't sleep for thinking about what it must have been like mm. there. And very early on, the man in charge, Lord Nelson, is hit. And it's over to your ancestor to take control. Enormous responsibility. Well, I suppose it's a measure of how close that relationship was, that when one was shot and taken down below, the other could carry on in his stead and carry it through. Do you think you would have had the courage? No. I don't know how anybody could have withstood the noise that there must have been. Mm. And the medical side, absolutely not. I cut my finger and I'm dying, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't have done what he did. Presumably, they, they knew what they had to do individually so mm. well mm. that despite all of that, they could still do it. I think we three can be very proud of our ancestors. It must have been one of the most difficult battles that was ever fought, I'd say. Well, it, was, it, was a, it was an epic, was it not? I think it is an, an epic, epic battle. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I think it was. Yeah. It's the end of a journey which has taken Alan, Bridget and Jennifer back to one of the most famous sea battles of all time and introduced them to their heroic relatives who brought Britain victory. It was an iconic moment in British history. It was an epic battle and he was right at the centre of it and that standing on the deck of victory has been uh, just, you know, and sort of that, that made it pretty special, I must say. Yeah. The feeling that um, my ancestor had his leg uh, taken off by, by Jennifer's ancestor was quite overwhelming. I feel very proud of him. I think he was a very uh, professional man and I couldn't have done what he did in a million years. <laughs>